This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Department, and I've been asked to be the uh, MC here today uh, for the uh, Barbara Weinstock Memorial Lecture on the Morals of Trade. Uh, let me say a word first on the lecture, uh, since it hasn't been given for a few years. Uh, some of you may be new to this. The uh, lecture was endowed in 1902 by Harris Weinstock, a Sacramento businessman hoping to accelerate the arrival of, uh, quote, a better and cleaner day for all destined to spend their lives in commercial pursuits. Uh, 1902, incidentally, was the year that the Berkeley Economics Department was established. I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. Uh, previous speakers in this series include uh, Senator Paul Douglas in 1968, who, in addition to his uh, public career, uh, was uh, uh, involved in the uh, Cobb Douglas production function. Uh, Ralph Nader, the consumer advocate in 1974. The former labor leader and EU commissioner, uh, Neil Kinnock, in 1994. And in 1994, also, Amartya Sen, who uh, later won the Nobel Prize in economics. Today's speaker, uh, Jean-Jacques Lafont, is of comparable stature to these earlier speakers and has worked in several areas unified by the goal of using economic theory to improve economic efficiency and to enhance human well-being and welfare. His work fits in admirably with the goal of this series. I was asked to introduce Professor Lafont briefly, but as you will see, a brief description of his accomplishments is simply not possible, so I may go on a little bit longer than I had uh, planned or than was desired. Uh, he is Professor of Economic Sciences at the Université des Sciences Sociales in Toulouse. He received his doctorate from Harvard in 1975, where his dissertation won the Wells Prize and was published in 1980 as Essays in the Economics of Uncertainty by Harvard University Press. Professor Lafont is truly an economist's economist. He has published many fundamental books and articles focusing on uncertainty, public economics, informational incentive problems, regulation of industry, and many other topics in areas ranging from microeconomics to macroeconomics to econometrics. Most recently, he has focused his work on problems of political economy and of economic development. His two most recent books, both coming out uh, in this year, uh, illustrate his range of interests and uh, research, and they are Competition in Telecommunications, uh, published by MIT Press, and uh, Incentives and Political Economy, published by Oxford University Press. Professor Lafont has served as president of the Econometric Society and of the European Economic Association. And in addition to these and many other honors, he was made a Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur in 1991. And in 1993, he shared with Jean Tirole, who is a, a colleague of his at Toulouse, the first Irio Janssen Prize of the European Economic Association, which is given to the best European economist under the age of 45. Uh, we are honored today to welcome Jean-Jacques Lafont. He will speak on a topic that combines many of the areas to which he has made basic contributions, institutions, regulation, and development. Professor Lafont. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Very impressive place. The large movement towards privatization, liberalization, deregulation, which has taken place in the Western world, has been extended under the leadership of the World Bank and the United States, in particular, to transition and developing economies. This crusade was partly motivated by political reasons, it was supposed to help eradicate the totalitarian regimes often in place in these countries. The second motivation was simply that what is good for the Western world is good anywhere. 
In this lecture, I would like to discuss this latter belief by considering the regulation of infrastructure in less developed countries, LDCs, through the eyes of the new regulatory economics. Let me start with a few methodological remarks. The new regulatory economics treats the regulation of infrastructures as a principal agent problem in which the regulator, the principal, suffers from large asymmetries of information with respect to the regulated firm, the agent. For example, it does not know precisely the marginal cost of the firm, firm which is a natural monopoly. We can distinguish several steps in the analysis. First, we may assume that the regulator is a rational, benevolent representative of the population who is unrestricted in the contracts it can design for the firm. We can then rely on a fundamental result of economic theory, the revelation principle. Then any form of regulation is equivalent to a truthful revelation mechanism through which the regulator elicits, in an incentive-compatible way, the private information of the firm and then instructs the firm about the production level to achieve. By incentive-compatible way, I mean a way which respects the strategic private interest of the firm, which are different from those of the regulator. Within this paradigm, we can discuss our question by a comparative statics analysis of a model borrowed from the new regulatory economics. A developing country then has simply parameter values which are different from those of a more developed country. A higher cost of public funds due to an inefficient tax system, a higher cost of auditing and control due to a lack of human and financial resources, lower transaction cost of site contracting due to less control, greater family ties or traditions, weak technological knowledge, greater asymmetries of information, etc. This simple framework is sufficient to discuss some issues concerning the methods of regulation. In particular, the large debate about the choice between rate of return regulation or price cap regulation. If we can say something interesting on the relevant characteristic of LDCs, we can develop specific recommendations for regulation in LDCs, everything else being fixed. Of course, one might want to affect those characteristics as well. The next methodological step is to recognize that contracts available to the regulator are incomplete, and more so in developing countries. This is due to stronger limit liability constraints, which restrict the possible penalties, or to weak abilities to commit, which favor opportunistic behavior. Such a framework is needed to discuss the structure of regulation, for example, the pros and cons of the multiplicity of regulators, either from a geographical point of view, the question of decentralization, or from a functional point of view, the question of one regulator per industry or a single regulator, the question of the integration or separation of competition policy and regulation. To the extent that we can say something specific to LDCs about their contractual limitations, one can develop specific messages for LDCs. Some characteristics, such as the ability to commit, rely on reputation effects and therefore on beliefs, and that some new questions appear of the possibility or not to transfer experience by affecting beliefs more quickly than through the only history of the particular country under consideration, or the usefulness of third parties to help strengthen commitment. The final step of the analysis is to give up the myth of the benevolent regulator or politician, which is easy here, uh, and take into account the incentive problem existing in the delegation to regulators or politicians of economic policy. We enter then the world of the political economy of regulation. The specificity of LDCs are here also very strong. The lack of democracy, the lack of counterpowers, 
induce very different behaviors of regulators and call for very different modes of intervention for outside agencies. Such a framework is particularly necessary when discussing privatization, competition policy, or universal service. These methodological remarks lead me to a presentation in four parts. In part one, we will see how the trade-off between rate of return regulation and price cap regulation can be modeled by the economics of information and how the consideration of the characteristics of LDCs lead to a view in terms of stages of development, each one calling for a different trade-off. In part two, we will study a simple example of structural regulation by asking the question of the pros and cons of the separation of regulators as an instrument against capture. This will lead to a notion of vicious circle of underdevelopment. In part three, we will consider the major issue of access pricing in the liberalization of infrastructure and we'll ask which, we will ask which specific recommendation we may have for LDCs through the new regulatory economics. Finally, in part four, we will discuss briefly the privatization of natural monopolies in a non-democratic country, and through a positive theory of privatization, raise the issue of the legitimacy of outside intervention in such countries. So let me start with uh, the analysis of incentive regulation in LDCs. I will put up, put up some slides which uh, might help some, some of you, but you don't have to look at it. Following the pioneering application of incentive theory to regulation by Loeb and Magat and Baron Meyerson, the 1980s have witnessed the emergence of a new theory of regulation which emphasizes the asymmetries of information between government, regulatory commissions, firms, and various interest groups. Consider the regulation of a natural monopoly which has private information both on its technological characteristics, adverse election parameter, or on an effort variable, moral hazard, which decreases cost but creates a non-monetary disutility to the firm's management. Cost is exposed observable by the regulator who can determine the pricing rule and the cost reimbursement rule. However, when costs are high, when high costs are observed, the regulator does not know if it is because a firm is technically inefficient or because of low effort levels. This asymmetric information about the firm's cost implies that an informational rent must be given up to the firm when it is efficient, since it, it can always mimic the inefficient firm and realize the same cost with a lower effort level. Note that this rent is increasing in the effort level required from an inefficient firm. Assuming now an utilitarian regulator, social welfare equals the sum of the net surplus of consumer and the firm's utility level minus the social cost of the net transfer from the regulator to the firm. Because of the need to use distortive taxation to finance this transfer, we use the social cost of funds to evaluate this transfer. The social cost of funds implies that it is socially costly to give up a rent to the firm, since any dollar that can be captured from the firm enables the government to decrease the distortive taxes by one dollar, which costs more than one dollar to society by definition. The regulator will want to decrease this costly rent and will be led to distorting the allocation of resources for the pur this purpose, that is to say, to accept inefficiencies. Optimizing expected social welfare under incentive and individual rationality constraint of the firm, the regulator determines the optimal trade-off between efficiency and rent extraction and optimal pricing. The trade-off between efficiency and rent extraction is determined by the cost reimbursement rule. Full reimbursement of cost enables the regulator to perfectly control the rent given up to the firm 
but induces large inefficiencies because there is no incentive for cost minimization. At the other extreme, payments independent of cost induce proper behavior of cost minimization, but in general leave large rents to the firm. The second part of optimal regulation is the pricing rules, which reduce here to the Ramsey pricing rules. More specifically, relative deviation of prices from marginal cost evaluated for the effort level induced by the cost reimbursement rule are, should be inversely proportional to the super elasticity of the commodities. The coefficient of proportionality is increasing in the cost of public funds. As we have uh, stressed above, a major characteristic of developing country is the high cost of public fund. It is easy to see that this high cost calls for higher prices of the commodities produced by the natural monopoly, and more interestingly, for lower power incentive schemes or low efforts due to high shares of cost reimbursement. The intuition for this last point is as follows. A higher cost of public funds means a higher cost of giving up rents and also a higher cost of inefficiency, but relatively, the cost of rents increases faster. Optimal regulation sacrifices some efficiency to decrease those rents. It is therefore an argument favoring in LDCs cost plus scheme vis-a-vis -vis fixed price schemes, or rate of return regulation versus price cap regulation in the language of regulation theory. Monitoring of effort generally enables the regulator to reduce the information rents and therefore calls for higher power incentive scheme, that is to say, incentive mechanisms which induce higher effort levels. A less efficient monitoring technology of LDC will call for relatively less powerful incentive scheme. Indeed, low incentives and monitoring are substitute instruments to extract the firm's rent. A decrease of the use of one instrument makes the other instrument more attractive. An increase in the cost of public funds induces low incentives both directly and indirectly through the decrease of the more costly monitoring. I have emphasized so far the strong assumption of perfect observability of cost. In practice, costs are imperfectly observable. Noisy cost observation in itself is not a problem as long as risk neutrality can be maintained. But one must take into account the possibility of cost padding, that is to say the many ways in which a firm can divert money. Cost can now be increased by undue charges which benefit the management and the workers. Note that the existence of cost padding is itself the result of the regulator's desire to extract the firm's rent. Cost padding will never arise if the regulator offer a fixed price contract since the firm will pay the entirety of each unit of money diverted. Imperfect auditing of cost padding calls for a shift toward higher power incentive scheme. In the extreme, if auditing did not exist, only fixed price contract will be possible. Indeed, they will be the only ones preventing unlimited cost padding by making firms residual claimants of their cost. It is therefore very intuitive that a deterioration of the auditing technology, as can be expected in developing countries, will induce an even higher desire to shift towards fixed price mechanisms. This effect is reinforced by the saving of auditing costs allowed by fixed price mechanism in countries with high cost of funds. And obviously this conflicts with the finding of the previous discussion, and I will return to it. The next consideration we want to integrate is the necessary decentralization of regulation to regulatory agencies and ministries. The main role of this institution is to bridge partially 
the information gap between the public decision maker and the regulated firm. But then a new issue appears, the possible capture of the regulatory agency by the firm. Such a collusion will occur with greater probability if the stakes of collusion are high, if the cost of site transfers between the firm and the regulator are low, and if no incentive mechanism is in place for the regulator. In this theory, the stake of collusion amounts to the information rent that an efficient firm obtains when the regulator hides the fact that the firm is efficient. And from our previous analysis, this rent is increasing in the level of effort chosen by the less efficient firm. The maximum bribe that a firm will be willing to offer to the agency is the stake of collusion. However, it should be discounted by the price of internal transfers, which includes the cost of being discovered, as well as the need to use often indirect transfers that are less efficient than monetary transfers. Capture is avoided if the agency is paid an amount larger than the discounted value of the stake of collusion when it reveals the firm is efficient. I will call this constraint the collusion-proof constraint. In the simplest case, the regulatory response to the fear of capture is to satisfy this collusion-proof constraint at the lowest possible cost. This includes shifting optimal regulation toward cost-plus scheme to decrease the stake of collusion and improving monitoring to increase the cost of site transfers. Three features of developing countries call for even higher shifts towards cost plus mechanism. Again, we can expect a lower cost of internal transfer because of less monitoring of illegal activities. Incentives payments to the agency are more costly because of funds. Third, it may be politically more difficult to create such strong incentive payments. So let me summarize the discussion by putting forward the idea of stages of development. In stage one of development, the auditing mechanisms are so bad that powerful incentive schemes are unavoidable. Fixed price procurement mechanism, price cap regulation. They promote short-run efficiency, but are very costly in terms of required rents favor exposed inequality, and encourage some types of corruption. This stage should be used to develop a good auditing system. Once it is in place, one should switch rather discontinuously to stage two of development by moving toward low-power incentive scheme, as I argued before. As development progress, it will be optimal to move slowly up again toward more powerful incentive scheme. That's what theory suggests. And note that this theoretical view fits reasonably well the historical evolution of the regulation of electricity in the Western world. In the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, electricity companies were regulated by price caps which evolved by introducing various forms of indexing and pass-through clauses. Then we had the discontinuous event of nationalization in Europe and creation of rate of return regulation in the US, which I don't know as well, which in both cases correspond, in fact, to a strong shift toward very low power incentive schemes that I refer to in stage two. Since then, we have seen more, rec uh, more recently a strengthening of incentive by moves toward price cap regulation with different uses of cost observability, which weaken their incentive properties. So as you see, I've illustrated the fact that the debate between price cap regulation and rate of return regulation for developing countries 
can be, can be discussed to some extent within this simple paradigm of benevolent regulator. And of course, further complication associated with contractual limitations, such as the ratchet effect due to limited commitment or with political economy, such as the dependence of regulation on the types of capture of the government, should also be considered for a complete analysis. But let me move now to my second part uh, about the separation of powers and a discussion about structural regulation. It is well recognized now that the design of proper institutions is key to development. Among the characteristics of governmental institution, separation of power stands as a cornerstone of democracy. Article 16 of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, 1789, goes as far as saying, a society in which the guarantee of rights is not assured, nor the separation of powers provided for, has no constitution. But it is Hamilton and Madison in the Federalist paper who have referred the most to Montesquieu as the oracle who is always consulted and cited on these subjects. And they indeed put these principles into practice for the American Constitution within a broader view of checks and balances. Separation of power is valuable, but not easy to implement because it is costly, it affects the transaction cost of collusion, and because the separated powers may collude. The cost-benefit analysis of separation of powers depends on the characteristic of the country. And I want to ask now how the net value of separation of power is affected by the level of development. More specifically and more modestly, we will consider the regulation of an industry and we will ask how the value of duplicating regulation changes as various parameters characterizing the level of development vary. It is only recently that economists have started modeling the value of separation of power. The first reason for duplicating regulation agencies is yardstick competition. Using the correlation of the signals obtained by these agencies enables the principal to extract in a costless way their information rate. Alternatively, separation helps create incentives for activities which have negative externalities, the ones on the others. For example, each regulator may act as an advocate for a given cause. A second and related reason for separation of power is to act as a device against regulatory capture. This general idea has been known for a while by political scientists, and the public choice school has also emphasized the fact that institutional rules may be designed to discourage rent-seeking behavior. In a paper with David Martimor, we have provided a modeling of this idea of the idea that separation of power can act as a device against regulatory capture. And this idea should be distinguished from Yardstick competition, which is a pure informational competition. The third reason reported in Mo is that separation of power may be beneficial when intertemporal commitment is limited. It may act as an indirect way to commit. Agency models have been developed recently to capture this idea. Here, I will pursue the second idea, namely that separation of regulators may act as an instrument against regulatory capture. Consider a simpler version of the regulation model we had before without moral hazard and cost observability, in which the marginal cost of the regulated firm can be low or high, 
the social welfare maximizer, who is uninformed about this marginal cost, wishes, as before, to maximize expected social welfare. And the, let's assume that the good produced by the regulated monopoly is now a public good, and there is a cost of public fund. Because the marginal cost is private information of the firm, as before, the social welfare maximizer must give up an information rent to the firm when it is a good type. To mitigate this cost, the social welfare maximizer delegates the task of supervising the firm to regulators to decrease the information rent. More precisely, let's assume that the regulator may discover in a verifiable way the true value of the marginal cost of the firm with some probability when it is a low value, when the firm is efficient. And let's assume that we have two possible supervision technology corresponding to two signals about this unknown information, which may or may not be correlated. And the question is, should we have one regulator or one regulator associated with each information technology. Let's assume that regulators are risk neutral and face a limited liability constraint, which implies that their payment or their incentive payment must be non-negative. When a regulator has be, transmits his signal to the principal, the firm loses its information rent because regulation now is under complete information. But the regulator has the discretion of hiding the signal he has observed, and therefore, as before, there is a risk of capture. Collusion-proof regulation requires a payment to the regulator when he reports the signal that the firm has a low cost, which is greater than the stake of collusion, discounted by the inverse of the transaction cost of collusion, as we saw before, okay? So let's first observe that with one regulation, what is the shape of the optimal collusion-proof regulation? Using the three parameters we had before to characterize a low level of development, higher cost of public fund, lower transaction cost of collusion, greater asymmetric information, we obtain that all these parameters have the same effect on the power of incentives in the optimal collusion-proof mechanism. So as explained before, optimal collusion-proof regulation with this single regulator should be less high power in less developed countries. Similarly, let's look now at what happens if you have two regulators. Separation of regulators saves on incentive payments for regulators and produces a higher power optimal regulation. And the intuition is as follows. When one regulator reports truthfully his observation, he makes impossible a side contract between the firm and the other regulator. In other words, he creates a negative externality on the other regulator. A single regulator will internalize these externalities. Independent regulators do not internalize those negative externalities. And in some sense, this increases the transaction cost of collusion. Therefore, it decreases the incentive payments required to avoid collusion and favors higher power incentives. Let's see now how the gain, this gain I've just explained, from the separation varies with the parameters characterizing development. The gain from separation of power is related to the savings on incentive payments for regulators, and therefore, it increases with the cost of public funds, with greater asymmetric information, or with lower transaction cost of collusion. So we may conclude that separation of power is even more valuable in developing countries. But three factors limit the value of separation of power. First, there is a possibility that the regulators collude and coordinate their collusive behavior. And this possibility appears greater in less developed country. There is a mere cost of an additional regulator, which is higher in a developing country with a higher cost of public funds. 
And if we believe that the transaction cost of collusion decrease when the regulator is more specialized, this weakening effect is higher for countries with low transaction cost of collusion. Therefore, we obtain that the implementation of separation of power is more costly in developing countries. This last result is important to moderate the enthusiasm of development economics, which sees rightly institution building as key to development. Even though improvement in institutions are even more valuable in developing country, it is unfortunately more difficult to implement in such countries. In our example, the implementation of the institution separation of power is more useful and more costly for the same reasons, basically, leaving us with an ambiguous overall net result if the various weaknesses of these countries are not addressed simultaneously. And I believe that this type of result is actually quite general. Let me move now to a discussion of liberalization, of the liberalization process in LDCs. The former natural monopolies for public services in telecommunication, electricity, gas, transportation have been reconsidered, as you know. Parts of these firms are now viewed as potentially competitive, like long distance in telecommunication, generation in electricity or gas, and consequently open to competition, while some elements are still considered as natural monopolies, like the transmission grid in electricity, the tracks in railways, which remain regulated, eventually with new forms of regulation, like incentive regulation we discussed. The management of the interface between the competitive and regulated sector is crucial for the success of liberalization. The condition under which competitors can access the regulated sector, which is an essential input for their activities, determine the profitability of entry and therefore the level of competition in the sectors open to competition as well as the efficiency of the utilization of the natural monopoly elements. And despite its vital role for the success of liberalization, viewed as a key institutional change for development, no specific proposal of desirable access pricing rule for developing economies is currently available. The pricing of interconnection is highly dependent on the market structure. One can distinguish three different situations. In case one, there is vertical disintegration. The firm controlling the bottleneck, the natural monopoly, is not allowed to compete in the provision of services using the bottleneck as an input. In case two, the firm controlling the bottleneck is one competitor among many providing services using the bottleneck as an input. And finally, in case three, competition takes place between vertically integrated firms and each controls the bottleneck and provides services. The first question to ask is whether the characteristics of developing countries favor one or the other market structure. And here are some very simple remarks. The comparison between case one and two, vertical integration or not, rests essentially on a comparison between the economies of scope that vertical integration makes possible and the problems of favoritism it raises. Since the economies of scope are likely to be independent of the characteristics of developing countries, at least for given technologies, while on the contrary, favoritism is more difficult to fight in LDCs, there should be a bias toward vertical disintegration in these countries. However, the comparison between case two and three rests on a comparison of the fixed cost, which will be associated with the competition in the provision of bottleneck, like local telephony, 
and the gains one may expect from this competition. The comparison is here difficult for LDCs, where the high cost of public funds makes more expensive both the duplication of fixed cost, but also the information rents of a monopolistic provision of the bottleneck. Furthermore, these comparisons are complicated by the dynamics of the industry, which may be moving from K toward case three, as in the telecommunication industry. Then vertical disintegration that we were discussing may in fact slow down the emergence of competition among vertically integrated firms, providing both local and long distance telephony. And then advising vertical disintegration may be particularly inappropriate. However, for railways, gas, or electricity, vertical disintegration of the tracks, the pipelines, or the transmission grid from transportation or generation may be, can be probably strongly advised if competition in services is introduced. In all these cases, one has a choice also between a single regulated entity owning the tracks, the pipeline, and so on, or between a share ownership of the bottleneck by the user who agree on rules to use for using it. The comparison is here between the inefficiency of regulation and the free rider problems of joint ownership. And in a country where regulation is easily captured, one may favor the second scenario. So let me now discuss a little bit uh, what we can say about the access pricing rules themselves. Consider first the case of an independently owned infrastructure. The utility owning the infrastructure sells wholesale services to other firms who market final services to the consumers. Kind of structure. The simplest case arises when the final services are produced by competitive industries at some constant marginal cost. Then it is as if the utility produces the final services itself at a unit cost equal to its own cost of providing access to the competitive downstream firms plus the latter's unit cost of producing the final services. The Ramsey formula can be applied to the price charge for access to the utilities infrastructure, and they can be decentralized through a price cap on access charge. Theory tells us that the excess of the access price over the marginal cost of access for good K, for example, relative to the access price should be inversely proportional to its demand price elasticity. The decentralization of Ramsey pricing by price caps enables the regulator to rely on the demand information of the regulated firm, even if we still have the difficult choice of the weights of the price cap. The demand information is naturally located with the users of the infrastructure. The utility can infer this demand information from the demand for access as long as the users report truthfully the type of final good for which they use the infrastructure. For example, for railways, this requires each shipper to specify truthfully the content of their cargoes. This additional agency problem may be a very serious issue in countries where one cannot expect a non-corrupted inspection system of cargoes to be workable. This is particularly, pro particularly problematic with a very large number of users, as assumed here. So we can issue a first warning in LDCs for a very competitive usage of the infrastructure Ramsey pricing of the infrastructure should be based on broad categories of usage which do not raise complex inspection issues and should be decentralized by price caps. Note that decentralization is only partial in the sense that the regulator will still have to make sure that the firms use the correct classification of services into the different categories. 
Another case is when instead of having a large number of uh, users of the infrastructure, um, each user is a monopoly in an independent market. So theory tells us that with market power of users, the marginal access charges should subsidize access, and excess profits of users should be recovered by nonlinear pricing or fixed charges. But such a policy requires a lot of knowledge from the regulator and raises issue of favoritism in price discrimination. In the absence of long-term contracts, there is a potential for expropriation of some large users' investment. The complexity and potential discretion involved in countries with little technical expertise and low transaction cost of collusion lead us to a second warning that the regulator should not attempt to undo the monopoly power of users with access price. Alternative policy should be used. Maybe competition policy, if you believe in it, in these countries. What is really problematic here is the fact that we need more instruments, and in general, the regulator is not given tax instruments and can only achieve very imperfectly multiple objectives with the single instrument of access prices. Access pricing based on the Ramsey principle raises additional problems. When the regulator designs the tariffs, the discretion surrounding the determination of elasticities raises the problem of capture. When the price cap is used, the problem is transferred to the choice of weights. So a non-discretionary method for choosing weights in the price cap is essential. In practice, the choice of a good starting point for price regulation is very difficult and generally based on past prices. And this is a crucial area where benchmarking made by good experts will be very useful uh, for LDCs. Let me now consider the case where we have vertical integration more difficult case, in which the vertically integrated utility, the incumbent, provides access to the infrastructure and also sells a service using
Why? Because the benefits obtained under privatization follow from the greater efficiency of a management, which is now motivated by profits, which are partially captured by the government at the privatization stage in the form, in general, of underpriced shares. So for a low delta, the government is almost benevolent and should not and does not privatize. For very large value of the corruption parameter, the private gains associated with public firms cannot be compensated by the appropriation of the rent under privatization because of the necessity to leave control to the private shareholder because the country has no credibility, for example. So such an inverted U-shaped theory was reasonably borne by data for sub-Saharan Africa. Just a positive theory of privatization. If we accept this view of the world, we can then discuss the role of outside agencies, such as the World Bank, in promoting privatization. Clearly, just recommending privatization has no effect if the non-benevolent government prefers the public regime. The outside agency may tilt the trade-offs of the government with conditional aid. Privatization, particularly with foreign capital, has a reasonable commitment power so that such a quid pro quo can succeed. Uh, and it is, in my view, a much more credible quid pro quo than the commitment of, to implement, for example, a competition policy for a given level of aid. The lack of credibility may also be on the side of the outside agency. Uh, and we have this current debate between conditionality and selectivity for aid. However, the recognition of the capture of LDC's government leads to the following dilemma, in my view. Either one engineers a quid pro quo, which maintains corrupt governments in power and maintain their welfare, or with NGOs, education programs, or other means, one attempts to affect the political process itself in favor of more democratic institutions. But then we can raise the issue of the legitimacy of such an intervention. This problem itself leads us to question the incentives of the outside agencies and of the governments involved in such conditional aid programs. Privatization is just one example of many constitutional designs for which we must recognize the limits of mechanism design. Economic institutions are actually endogenous, and the outcome of conflicting interest groups within political institutions. So my conclusion is not only that we must question the relevance of the Western world's recipes for LDCs, as I have tried to show you with a few examples, but by recognizing, in addition, the incentive problems raised by their implementation, we must ask how we can legitimate the political necessary interferences in LDCs needed to achieve better institutional design. Thank you for your attention.
Um, I, I'm not too worried about um, going from uh, one-dimensional to uh, multi-dimensional uh, incentive problems. It's, it's essentially a technical problem. Uh, the, the basic idea will, will remain. You know, asymmetric information, one-dimensional or multi-dimensional, leads to rents. That's, that's a, the main point. Now, uh, if rents are costly, uh, regulation or any kind of policy, really, is going to have to arbitrate between efficiency and this allocation of rents. And uh, uh, so I am more worried uh, with, um, you know, the, if you want to look at the real world, I'm more worried of introducing political economy consideration uh, to see uh, you know, how to use these ideas more practically than uh, and not using normative, a normative approach. Uh, th that I think uh, uh, we have to be very careful with. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I don't know of any result uh, uh, with multidimensional mechanism which uh, changes fundamentally the, the issue. I mean, you may get um, more, more bunching, less nice separation, things like that, but uh, the, the fundamental uh, trade-off between rent extraction and efficiency is, is still there. The problem is who is, who is doing this trade-off? And uh, uh, clearly, if you believe in these theories, uh, the trade-offs will be affected by, uh, or the, the type of trade-off that uh, politician or a majority wants to make uh, will change with the majority. And uh, that's an idea I want, I'm going to pursue for Latin America, because you know, in Latin America, they develop all kinds of, they push all these countries to have very nice auctions uh, of services and so on. Uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, six months or one year later, uh, there is renegotiation. Uh, and um, so we are thinking about, you know, all these ideas, all the reasons why you may have renegotiation. It can be for uh, opportunistic reason or for uh, you know, new, 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 new events. But one idea I want to pursue is the fact that uh, any new majority, political majority, should renegotiate uh, the contract because it should not be willing to make the same trade-offs. And uh, uh, well, that's, that's one idea. So to answer your question, I'm not too worried by that aspect, you know, this whole debate between Bayesian regu regulation and non-Bayesian regulation, I'm not too worried by that. Yes. Um, Joe. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I see the theory of mechanism design as saying two things about regulation. One is negative, that no possible regulatory structure can be better than certain things. And that seems very robust. And the other is trying to understand what the optimal arrangement looks like. And I have to say, as a former regulator, um, I am seldom reminded of reality by these models. And I wonder if But what, what is your main uh, criti criticism from a descriptive point of view that you know? Yes, but uh, don't you think that uh, you you took some decisions on the on the on the basis of your beliefs? 
So that's all this says. You know, this uh, distribution are particular specification of beliefs. So the fact that uh, optimal regulation, as it is shown here, depends on beliefs of the regulator it is not contradicted by, uh, by facts. Uh, so um, uh, one dimension in which we try to go closer to reality is by introducing uh, this political economy. Uh, but um, uh, no, I, I don't see exactly what is your, what is a fact of life that uh, you think is so, fa so far from, from this model? Like, give me an example, then I can try to think about it. If, if you are saying that we should not think that regulation comes out of maximizing social welfare, uh, I completely agree with you that uh, uh, maybe I, you know, I went a, a little f fast, but what we want to put at the top of the model is a political model, right? And. Uh, I gave just a simple example of a political model where, depending on the majority, you, you have people who have different uh, stakes in the, in the profits, for example, of those firms, and this will affect changes. For example, um, uh, one could argue that um, you know, the people who favor price cap regulation uh, will be the ones who have high stakes in profits because we know that the price cap regulation uh, goes towards efficiency but goes also towards big rents. So uh, that shares move to price cap regulation as many um, rational, but one, one argument will be that um, it moves towards, uh, in, uh, in, uh, it is favorable to, to uh, people who have um, uh, capital. I think um, uh, Sappington tried to, in fact, check this idea on the U.S. I don't know uh, the final work, but he, the idea was to try to see if the evolution in the different states of the U.S. Uh, and the speed at which it was moving like towards price cap regulation, which is a higher power incentive scheme in favor of rents, was influenced by the political nature of the, of the state. If, uh, you know, uh, but I don't, I don't know the, the results. But the, no, the, your point that the political economy uh, has to be introduced, I mean, I think is ob absolutely clear. The only point I stress is the fact that to have a good and clear normative theory is useful before doing that step. And some people don't want to recognize that, then I, don't, I disagree. Uh, the fact, when we wrote our book on, on normative uh, uh, regulation, um, it was obvious to me that uh, I could, on the top of that, put a political model that would uh, that would uh, go further. And uh, instead, we we were we have been accused in this country of being communists. So, <laughs> so I, I think one should be able to see the usefulness of a normative approach, even when one is very convinced that political economy is essential. Yes. Sorry. On your separation of powers on that particular model, have you introduced inspector generals into that framework? Because frequently on conditionality, uh, the World Bank and various government agencies are arguing that there should be some checks and balances or some monitoring of the regulator themselves. Moreover, they've advocated creating institutions where those parties who are harmed or, or share the burden of the rents that are being generated 
that they set up institutions to represent those interests to counter the other influences that you have in the law. They're outside the law. No, <clears throat> it's clear that um, uh, What is missing, essentially, in those countries uh, is the fact that some groups are not represented. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the worst bias has come from the fact that politicians are captured by, uh, by small groups. And uh, unfortunately, I think the only hope for a change uh, is education, and it will take a lot of time. I think in Africa, what strikes me is the fact that uh, people don't even dare to complain. Uh, and uh, you know, the first step is to organize those as groups. That's why one talks so much about uh, uh, the civil society. But the point I try to raise at the end uh, is that I think there is a little bit of a problem. I see. In, in Brazil, some very um, nice people uh, trying to organize civil society in, or Brazil or somewhere else in order to influence the political equilibrium with a good idea that you know, some groups are not represented, so you have to give them power, uh, information, and then you will restore a better balance. And it is certainly going in the right direction. I just raised the issue of you know, who has a right to intervene like that in a country, and, uh, and then we should question you know, the, the motivation of these people who do that, and, and be sure they do it for the right reason. Uh, now, the other, that's a, for the second point. Uh, when uh, this model, when we create separation uh, of regulators or separate ministries and so on, when you do these structural changes, one should not be too naive about uh, the impact because what these regulators can do very quickly is to collude themselves. Uh, so, and it, it's a very general idea in economics. We, we think we can solve many problems by just delegating decisions to the right people. You know? You cannot commit to a good monetary policy, so let's find somebody who can do it. Uh, it's a simple, it's, if, if it was so easy, I mean, it would be, uh, it will be um, known. But so one hope, one direction of research I have for that is uh, that asymmetric, again, asymmetric information between those regulators that you have created separately will introduce frictions in their collusion, right? So uh, we have developed a theory of collusion and asymmetric information, which shows that you know, this collusion will be imperfect. So to the extent that this is true, the separation will be really implemented, and you do not have to worry too much about their collusion. Now, the fact that you want to uh, control regulators themselves, uh, that's, um, that's clear. But who is controlling those regulators? I mean, either you believe that it is at the top, you have a benevolent agent who is controlling those regulators, and then you are back in the, in the normative benevolent framework. If there is no lim constraint on the contracts that this nice guy can put, then uh, we, can, we are back to normative economics. So political economy is really the recognition of the incompleteness of the Constitution and of the fact that because Constitution is an incomplete contract, uh, all these people at the top, all these politicians, have a lot of discretion that they use to further interest groups. Uh, so in a sense, it's intimately related to a in theory of incomplete contracts. So I see myself political economy just as one exercise in incomplete contracting uh, with, um, 
with, um, and as you know, what's very uh, weak in all the theory is uh, uh, the, uh, what kind of the motivation of the restriction on these contracts. And political economy is relatively nice in the sense that we can use uh, reality. We can use uh, the institution as they are. Uh, so we have some, uh, some idea about the restrictions uh, which exist in practice. So we can take this as given. Not sure. Pablo, you wanted to say something? Yes. Uh, you are in paper uh, a very pessimistic uh, view on the ability of agencies, regulators to, um, to implement complex uh, regulatory systems. And essentially, you base that on purely. things. Um, uh, I don't know where to start. Um, um, you know, first of all, I am, I am uh, very uh, impressed by my experience, which is in Africa, which uh, is not, it's not Argentina. Huh? So I will I argue for the notion of stages of development because I think that uh, uh, the, the policy depends very much on the stage of, of development. Uh, and when you tell me um, in countries where I have worry about uh, corruption a lot, I can find rules which are simple and work, great. I mean, that's exactly what we should do as economists, is to provide 
that's, I, I've been arguing in favor of that. Uh, uh, adapting our advice and our rules to the situ to those uh, uh, the particular situation of those countries and uh, uh, you are um, you are optimistic about what one can achieve with simple rules uh, certainly not as no if they are very very simple one must lose something somewhere so uh, but but um, the whole question uh, is, um, uh, should we go there and, and, and say, in the Western world, we have finally discovered that the best policy is a price cap policy like this and that? Or should we look at history and ask the question, why did America use rate of return regulation for 30 years? Was it because people were stupid in that time? I'm not sure. See, that, that's the problem. I'm asking myself, why uh, do we give advice which are completely different from the stages through which we, our countries went through? So I think it's important to, to see, uh, to, to understand why we move to new poli policies. Uh, and uh, I think that the two arguments are probably valid. It's because the situation has changed, and it's also because we learn. And if it is because we learn, then the next question is, how can we transfer this knowledge to those countries? Uh, and why should they believe us, you know, just because uh, the experience in other countries happened to be this? So this is a question of the transfer of knowledge. Uh, so. I was just observing in a particular case that uh, the historical development uh, fits pretty well what theory will suggest. But I'm not you know, concluding that it is because of that that we nationalize. Uh, but we have to be careful. I, you know, I'm, I'm not a big specialist of uh, development economics, but I am sometimes stoned by the way people uh, approach this issue uh, at the World Bank. Uh, and it's, I think it's not their fault. I think they do the best they know, but there is very little theoretical thinking uh, in adapting our policies to those co countries. Uh, there is, I think, a deficit in economics, uh, in particular of using all these new ideas of the last 20 years. Uh, for development economics, uh, and I hope one can. One and the reason why some people, uh, um, you know, are so upset with the World Bank and so on, you know, it's not not only that they are uh, crazy. I mean, it's because they feel intuitively that maybe we are not giving exactly the right advice. So, yes. I found very interesting your account of the role that elites in particular developing countries. I was wondering, following up on what you were saying, is there is any, what role do you assign to the, what a political scientist here are to call it, systemic communities? The fact that perhaps elites in developing countries would assume a given path uh, just because in the profession, that's regardless of the way to do things, what you were saying that it would not account perhaps the level, the stage of development or the history and to what extent, because that's not just you know, self-interested uh, elites. I'm talking about the role of ideas. Mm -hmm. The role of ideas must be very strong to explain why, in Latin America, economics is taken so seriously compared to Europe. And the only explanatory variable is that there are many more graduate students from America. Uh, so uh, uh, it's very striking for Europeans to go there and to suddenly to see people who take seriously economics. Uh, so uh, no, you are right, I think. Uh, ideas play a role, and that's good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.